Okay, chapter 22. So Dish and Spoon have run away together like in the nursery rhyme. We've got um, Flabbergast has made sure that his sister is going and she won't be back for a while. She sort of not stated that, but you know, we know this is a trilogy, so this is the last book as far as I'm aware. And Flabbergast has just announced, well, let's have some strawberry tea. Let's go home. And Nine has questioned home. Hmm. In tired silence, they made their way through the house park towards the head, bleh, the house at the edge of magic. Flabbergast opened the front door and they all slumped inside and stood in the hallway. I suppose it hasn't been all bad, said Bonehead, pulling his positive thinking for brainless skeleton's book from his ribcage and flicking through. I have my fluffy socks, my cushions and this. He lifted the black cloth on the cage in the hallway and revealed a little dragon skeleton inside. I think it shall rather... He picked up the book again, paired closer and pointed with his bony hand to a paragraph. Raise the spirits of looking after a pet. But nine spirits weren't raised. She folded her arms. And the chain and padlock on the cage when it was in the shop, Bonehead? That didn't give you the warning signs? Oh, undoubtedly an overreaction, said Bonehead, waving a bony hand dismissively. Think on the bright side. He waved his book at her as the dragon skeleton hiccuped and a tiny green flame darted from his skull. Nine narrowed her eyes suspiciously. We have our shopping, said Flabbergast. Let us leave this cursed place. Nine's eyes pinged wide again as, she, as something occurred to her. We can't leave yet, she said. We owe Alfwyn the undutably dutiful the gold and we don't have it. What are the chances we'll get away with it? Ooh, boom bonehead, hopefully. You never know. It might be impossible, said Flabbergast. A business like his has spies everywhere. What will we do? We simply do not have the gold, madam. Then a thought struck nine. But we do have... She ran down the hallway to the kitchen as her brain danced with an idea. She grabbed the bucket full of orange gloop and marched back past Flabbergast who stood with both the door and its mouth open. Take gloop, said Eric, scratching his head with his long fingernail. Lady clever. Oh yes, Nine called over her shoulder as she headed for this and that shop. Lady is clever. A few minutes later, she plonked down the bucket of orange gloop on Alfwyn the undutably dutiful's table, making him jump. It's not gold, but it makes stuff look golden, Nine said. Watch. She reached into the bucket, grimacing, at sh grimacing as she grabbed a handful of the orange slime. She flicked some at the tail of the cat statue with more than a little satisfaction, and it started to shimmer immediately. Not gold, but makes it appear so. That's a filthy rotten trick. He gave half a smirk and then nodded. Hmm, I think that appeals to me even more so. Now, why doesn't that surprise me? And you'll be pleased to know that we have an endless supply of this gloop. Nine twisted her mouth thoughtfully, though I'm not entirely sure anyone knows why. She gave one last glare at the cat statue. Its eyes shifted to look over Nine's shoulder. She froze for a moment, then whirled round. No one was there again. Nine narrowed her eyes suspiciously at the cat. Then the purple lizard croaked one last time as she walked out of the shop. As she weaved back through the crowded cobbled streets to the house park... Nine felt the same feeling of unease, like someone was breathing down her neck. She reached inside her satchel and rested her hand on the music box, just to remind herself it was safe. Still, she was no closer to discovering what her ma had left in her safekeeping. She she felt a pang that she felt a pang at a missed opportunity. Mm, hate missed opportunities. She would have given anything, anything to know more about her ma. As Nine arrived back at the house, Flabbergast opened the door to her. Ah, oh, madam! He gave her a little nod. Just in time for tea, he said, stepping back to let her into the hallway. Tea? said a lava-like voice coming from beside the front door. Hmm, my favourite. Nine spun around to see the witch standing in the doorway. Ah, oh, brother, we do meet again, she said, strutting into the hallway. How terribly thrilling. What? cried Flabbergast. What are you doing here? Oh, causing a little trouble, 
said the witch, examining a scarlet fingernail. I rather feel like a holiday. Hmm, I do love holidays. Holiday? Holiday? Where? said Fabergast sharply. His eyes narrowed. How? I need to visit the mortal world, said the witch brightly. Someone owes me a favour. No, 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 said Flavagarth. No, you absolutely not coming in here. The witch smiled sweetly and then looked at Nine. Are you going to tell him or shall I? Nine grimaced a little. Oh, it was part of the deal in exchange for saving Dish and Spoon from Ophidia. She needs my assistance. Assistance? Flavagarth groaned. Madam! Have you not yet learned that associating with my sister cannot possibly end well? What in the name of the sometimes dead were you possibly thinking? I was thinking of our friends, actually, said Nine. Flabbergast looked at Nine, looked at his sister and sighed heavily. <sighs> I would not trust her with so much as a cabbage. The witch smiled, tilted her head and made a small mock curtsy. Then please, said Nine, just trust me. Flabbergast looked at Nine. You ask a great deal, madam, but agreed. Oh, such wonderful news, brother, said the witch, shutting the front door behind her. Speaking of which, I know how your powers can be restored. What? gasped Flabbergast. Oh, how? All in good time, said the witch airily. I think we all need a cup of strawberry tea. She stood beside the coat of arms on the wall in the hallway. Shall I do the honours? Without waiting for an answer, she pulled the tongue of the toad on the coat of arms. Zabam! Nine felt the strange but now familiar feeling of her brain being sucked out of the top of her skull. Everything hurtled in a direction that she didn't understand, but was almost certainly up. The witch smiled and strutted down the hallway to the kitchen. Witch home, said Eric, looking at Flabbergast with wide eyes. Yes, said Flabbergast tightly. Apparently she is. Which trouble? Yes, she definitely is. Make tea, said Eric, patting Flavagar's arm. Then he lolloped towards the kitchen with some urgency, followed by Bonehead and Kaz. It won't be for long, said Nine. I just need to help her with something. I'm just, well, I'm just not entirely sure what that is. And that, madam, said Flavagar, is precisely what troubles me. Nine couldn't argue with that. Flabbergast sighed and then headed down the hallway towards the kitchen. Eric, we need to fix the teapot, although I have the most horrible feeling that the glue is somewhere in the cupboard under the stairs. Nine's heart sank as she thought about all the shopping that had just been dumped in there. They all desperately needed a cup of strawberry tea. Ma's teapot! I know where a teapot is, Nine called to Flabbergast, then, heard, then headed for the plum carpeted stairs. With every step she took, she became more certain. She would show him the torn parchment pieces and tell him everything about the safekeeper. If Nine had trusted him and told him earlier, perhaps there would have been a way to find what her ma had left, instead of trying to manage it all by herself. Maybe Nine could even persuade him to come back to beyond and help her look. Beyond. So much had happened, so much to think about. The spoon was gone. But Mr Downs had owned the bookshop. He was a wizard, after all, all this time, and she had never known. Maybe that's why he had all those books on magic on the highest shelf in the library. Nine made her way to her ma's bedroom and flopped on the floor beside the bed. She pulled the gold-starred teapot out from under the bed, lifted the lid and heavily heartedly pulled out all the pieces of parchment. She put the fragments together and watched as the words appeared and caught her breath because now they read... Retrieved with thanks, the safekeeper. Retrieved? Retrieved? Nine's heart leapt. She hadn't retrieved anything. The only thing she had moved from the bookshop was, well, Nine had her hand inside her satchel and pulled out the mystery of Wolven Moor. She turned the book over. She flipped through some of the pages and gave a book a little shake. Nothing. It was just a book. Unless, what if... Nine placed the closed book on the floor and pulled out the music box from her satchel. She held it in front of the book and, with desperate hope in her heart, she began to play the music backwards. 
As she reached the end of the tune, suddenly the book flipped open all by itself to the map at the front. The wild wolf and moor. Nine gasped and leaned back further against the bed frame. Something strange was happening. The image of the map on the two pages began to wobble and reshape itself. A new map was appearing in its place. The moorland mutated and turned into an island, surrounded by a dark sea, with a little pop. A lighthouse appeared, perched on the cliff top. Nine's heart raced. This was definitely not the same as the normal book. She reached on the bed behind her and grabbed her mother's copy with Eliza, written inside the cover. She checked the map. Her mother's copy showed Wolven Moor. With a shaking head, she played the music box backwards again. Nothing happened. It was just an ordinary book. She grabbed the bookshop copy. There was the lighthouse, and there was a secret map. This, this was what her ma had hidden away with the safekeeper. She had done it, after all. A little shiver went down her spine as she remembered the safekeeper's words. It's not yours. You don't even know what the item is. But curiosity was both Nine's weakness and her strength. If her ma had hidden away a map, she wanted to know what it was leading to. Nine heard footsteps coming towards the bedroom. Hastily, she moved away one piece of the parchment and the words, Retrieve with thanks, instantly vanished. She shut both copies of The Mystery of Wolf and Moor and shoved them underneath the bed just once just as someone opened her door. In strutted the witch. She paused for just a moment, then she saw Nine sitting on the floor. What are you doing there? Sorry, I thought it was the witch. It's Nine speaking. What are you doing here? said Nine, her heart thumping. She still didn't trust this witch as far as she could throw her, and beneath that bed and on that parchment were two things she very much didn't want an untrustworthy witch to see. Oh, don't mind me, said the witch coolly. There's only one open window in this house when it flies. The witch walked over to the window. The window that can never be closed. She brushed her fingertips over it thoughtfully and gazed outside at the silvery strands that danced now in the blackness. And the world between worlds is the perfect place because it's not like beyond. Out there, nobody stops, nobody hears, and nobody finds. Nobody finds what? asked Nine. Something was odd. She stared at the witch with the eyes of a keen pickpocket, watching every move. The witch took out a tiny secret jar from her sleeve. She uncorked it and tipped the scarlet words out of the window as the house zoomed on. Nine leapt up, desperately trying to make sense of any of the words as they flew out. Secrets, power, betrayed, friends, locket, consequences. Nine swallowed hard. She turned to face the witch, but she was looking at the secret jar that Nine had bought at the shop and which was still standing on the little bedside table. The turquoise letters still swirled around inside. You should probably listen to that secret before we land in your world, dearest thief. Before we land where? In my world? asked Nine. But the witch just smirked. She turned her back and walked over to the door. Suddenly, Flabbergast's exasperated voice floated up the stairs, followed by the endless chatter of a little cheeky voice. Madam! A talking candle? he groaned. A talking candle? said the witch, turning around, her eyes gleaming in delight. Ooh, you didn't. Do you not know what a talking candle is? No. What's so bad about a talking candle? Hmm. A talking candle is not truly a candle. It's the most mischievous fire sprite that can assume the form of a flame. Nine froze. Oh, and you brought one into the house, house at the edge of magic, continued the witch. How very strange my brother did not expressly and repeatedly forbid it. She gave a little snort of laughter. Madam, wailed Flabbergast from downstairs. It hasn't paused for breath. Oh, said the witch with a deep sigh of contentment. It's so marvellous to be home. And she swept out the room, closing the door behind her. Grateful for Flabbergast's protest being shut out, Nine turned to look again at the window. There was no sign of any scarlet letters, no sound of any whispered words, and the secret was lost forever never to be seen or heard again, just as the witch has had intended. 
Nora went over to the little bedside table, and the secret jar was tum the secret jar with its tumbling letters. When she had chosen the jar, it had somehow felt like just the right one. Nine hastily uncorked the lid of the jar, and the secret whooshed out in a stream of turquoise letters, which dashed around, forming their words. A voice began to murmur, and it was a voice she knew. Ma, whispered Nine. I had a special locket, not an ordinary locket. I don't know why it was for sale in that tat shop, but it was powerful and dangerous. An old family heirloom that once belonged to a feedy of the unpredictable. It was traded for, then entrusted to me. But then I argued fiercely with the one who gave it to me. I arranged for a spell to be put upon it, so she could never touch or use it again. I gave it to the dead bookshop owner, who said he would take it far away and keep it safe. I betrayed the trust of the one who gave it to me. Now, things can never be the same. Nine stared at the letters. Eyes wide as a million thoughts began to link in her mind. The locket that had belonged to a feedy the unpredictable. That was powerful and dangerous. Like star gold, like dish and spoon had tried to make for Ophelia to replace the original one that had been lost. When Uncle Mortimer, the unwise, sold it to this and that shop to pay for dragon drop-ins. When someone must have been given to Nine's mother, who had betrayed that person's trust and given it to the bookshop owner. <gasps> Mr Downs, who worked in the library and who Nine had pickpocketed all that time ago and had taken her prize, the locket that would not open this precious, dangerous, sought-after locket. The pocket's nest. Nine slumped down in shock, only vaguely aware of the metal bed frame digging into her back. The deal with the witch suddenly made sense. I had my sights on something else, something far, far more interesting, something as it happens, little thief, only you can help me with. It's really big drops of rain. The locket. The witch wanted the locket, which Nine had confessed about in her secret. Oh, and it was waiting in the same place it had been all this time, dangling broken from the beam in the pocket's nest. Nine leaned her head against the bed. They had saved Dish and Spoon. They had escaped the Fedia, but now, Nine feared, not only was Flabbergast Furious aren't going to come after them once she had escaped, which surely she would, but Nine had also accidentally promised the most tricky, clever witch she knew assistance in inquiring something so dangerous that her ma had gone to all the lengths of the realms to hide it so many years ago. And Nine would bet her strawberry tea that it had something to do with this map. Nine ran her fingers through her spiky hair. Oh no, what had she done? The safekeeper's words came back to haunt her. If something's left with a safekeeper, there's usually more than one person wants it. And that very person was travelling with them, in the house. She thought of the wizard, the troll, the skeleton, the gargoyle downstairs. The only family she had, waiting for the teapot so that they could make finest tea in all the realms. And her heart warmed, and her spirit lifted, because whatever mistake she had made, whatever danger she now was in, she knew she could she would trust them with any problem, any secret. She knew with all her heart, perhaps for the first time, she would never, ever be alone again. And perhaps, at this moment, that was enough. And that, my friends, is the end. And it just leaves us to the epilogue.